Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with episode 24 of Gumbo Live, the number one Facebook Live talk show dedicated to board gaming. Doc, that's because we're still the only Facebook Live talk show dedicated to board gaming. So it's it's an easy mantle for us to hold. But you know what? We're going to hold on to that position as long as we can. <clears throat> Board Gaming uh, with, with Gumbo Live, we're a proud member of Punchboard Media. Check out some of the other fine members of, Port, of uh, Punchboard Media like Open Seed Gaming. Marty and Sarah discuss this week their top five games that play great with two people. Check those out. Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table. Special guest tonight on Gumbo Live, Dr. Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's Games. We're going to be talking about uh, filler games and also some questions about uh, his development process and his publishing. Hit me up on social media tonight. I'm on Twitter at Board Game Gumbo, or you can hit me at Facebook, facebook.com slash Board Game Gumbo. Like the page. It helps us get the word out. You can always send me an email, boardgamegumbo at gmail.com. Uh, Steve, before we begin, I got a couple of quick show notes on the blog side. Uh, check out on, on uh, boardgamegumbo.com. We did a, a deep dive into one of my favorite games of all time, Concordia by Matt Gertz. Uh, I go into the reasons why I like the game and why I think uh, everyone should play it. And on the video side, I just posted up a recent interview that we did with Grant Wilson and Mike Ritchie of Rather Dashing Games. We talked about a game that's coming out in March of 2018 called Wakening Lair. It looks really good. Check it out. It's their newest release and uh, looking forward to hear it. Hey, let's get to our guest, Dr. Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's Games. Hey, man, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be oh. here. Yeah, good. Good to have you. I always like to do something I call the elevator pitch. You, you probably had that happen to where people pitch a game to you. Tell us, for those people who haven't heard of uh, Dr. Finn's Games or Steve Finn, tell us who you are and, and what Dr. Finn's Games is all about. Well, Dr. Finn's Games is known for uh, usually lighter filler games, but uh, all of my filler games still have a good level of strategy and tactical decision making. Uh, that said, even though I am known, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Rado, but uh, Rado calls me the king of the filler. Nice. And uh, so I have that mantle. And but uh, but I also have started to venture out into making slightly longer games, a little bit more involved. But nothing of mine is ever going to last more than an hour. So it's usually like that 30 minute, 20 to 30 minute sweet spot that I'm looking for. Um, Steve, you have come my to games. The, yeah, you've come to the right place. Uh, we're a big supporter of games that uh, last 20 minutes to an hour, filler games, gateway games, or gateway plus yeah. games is what I like to call them. Uh, when when people are introduced to Catan or Ticket to Ride, what's that next game that they should play or put into their collection? We love talking about that here on the Gumbo, uh, so hopefully we can get your insights on that. Before we do that, though, a little birdie told me that you saw some snow at the Army-Navy game 2017. What was that like? Uh, well, I didn't actually go. Oh, no. <laughs> I, was, well, I wasn't there. Oh, somebody no, told me no, you went no. to the game. Yeah, no, I didn't go to the game. I watched How'd it you? on, I watched it streaming. I watched the second half. Have you ever been to the Army Navy game? Uh, I've been working at West Point for eight years, but I've never actually been to a game. It is a dream of so, mine. I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, I am from the South and we love our college football here. And the, I, there's not a person in the South that skips the Army Navy game every year to watch it on TV. And this year it was just phenomenal with all that snow. That was real. I was hoping yeah. to get some insights from you on it. Yeah, sorry. I can't. That's I okay. don't. Not a big college sports fan. OK, well, I'll have a quiz yeah. for you then. Yeah. Do you like quizzes? Uh, it depends on what the topic is. <laughs> quick kit, quick yeah. quiz. One of these three sports does not have a board game. At least I could not find one. You tell okay. me which one. Golf, capture the flag, or ultimate frisbee? Golf. Golf does have a board game. Well, ultimate frisbee does on, have one too. Oh, it does? I, I it couldn't does. find it. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah. was going to ask you, why haven't you? I know that you're involved in ultimate frisbee. Why haven't you designed an ultimate frisbee board game? Well, there is actually, I think there's now two. Okay, tell, uh, tell me games about out there, but I actually don't own them. I don't have them. I've only seen it online. Uh, someone's trying to make one right now. I do have. I did make a uh, ultimate frisbee based card game. Okay, but uh, it was about recruiting uh, a team. So you were just trying to get seven players. It was called Seven on the Line. It was one of my very early efforts. So, so I have a, I, I have a, a long history of game making that I actually used to make card games myself out of my basically out of my basement 
Yeah, how, did, how did you get started in the industry? How long have you been doing this? Oh, I've been doing this for about 15 years. Uh, so I started, I was uh, living in Seattle at the time. And uh, home I of Wizards kind of, of the Coast? What's that? Home of Wizards uh, of the know, Coast? Uh, yes, Home of Wizards of the Coast. And I had discovered uh, board games again. You know, I grew up in a family. I've got a couple brothers and a sister. And we played games, but the more traditional Scrabble, Taboo, Balderdash, stuff like that. Um, so we're a big gaming family. Uh, but then for a long time, I just stopped playing board games. And then in my 30s, I had discovered, you know, uh, we, I started playing games again. There was a game called Web of Power that I think was the first game that I really liked. It was Michael Schacht, who's okay. done a number of other games. Yeah, I've heard of Michael uh, Schacht, but, but I don't know the game. Yeah, so it was, it was one of his games. He also, it, it's, it's been reborn as China and Han. So it's the same game, but it's been uh, released under different names. Uh, so that was my first you know, ex exposure to this uh, Euro games and stuff like that, to the more strategic board games. And right then I said, oh, this would be something, you know, at that time I said, oh, I'd like to make my own game. Uh, but I got sidetracked because I was trying to figure out a good way to make playing cards. And uh, there wasn't a game crafter. There weren't many places that were making individual decks of cards at that time. Sure. So I said, how can I make a deck of cards? So I, I, I hooked up with a local print shop and I made a deal with them that I could use, go in, use their printer. And they gave me a ridiculously low price as long as I didn't ask them to do any labor. So I okay. had brought in my own card stock. I sat at their computer. I put it in their paper machine, you know, in their printer and uh, I printed them up. The next thing was, how do I cut them? And so I went and I bought, uh, I found uh, someone else who's in the printing business to tell me about this die cutting process sure. uh, with a letter press. So I don't know if you've ever seen a letter press machine. Sure. But it's this huge two ton machine with like whistles and little suction cups that grabs the paper and this big wheel makes the thing spin and brings the die cut down. Uh, so I put one of these in my garage. I paid $2,000 for it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a lot of money back then. But I was like, I'm, I'm going for it. And, you know, and I started making card games. Uh, but actually what I started to do first was making decks of cards for people like poker cards for weddings, birthday gifts and stuff like that. So I got sidetracked with that for a little while. And then I got back to making games. But so that one of those early ultimate games, one of the early games was that ultimate game. And I just made, you know, it was like 70 or 80 cards packed in a little plastic case. Um, and I manufactured them all myself. So, so, then I, so I, are they still out there in the wild somewhere? They are out there. Some of them, I know some of the people who've backed like all of my Kickstarters. I, there's one person in particular who's like on a search for every single game I've ever made. And okay. I, he has a couple games that I don't even have anymore. And I'm like, Oh, but I want that game. I don't even have a copy of it. I don't even <laughs> know where it is. Um, but so I made a game. The thing that got me into the, the whole business that I'm in now, however, is a game uh, here. I, I got it right here, which you may or may not have heard of before. It's called Biblios. Sure, sure. I think it was so, under a different uh, name back then, though, right? That was under, yeah, it was called Scripts and Scribes. Right. And I had made, uh, the first time I did it, I made a, a, like about 50 copies of the game. And I used to get these cardboard boxes. I'd print labels and stick the labels on the boxes. You know, I mean, I did everything. I, you know, I bought dice. I threw them in there. I, I mean, I, I made the whole game myself. I sent them out, got really good reviews. Uh, so I made another batch. This time I, I did it in VHS cases for those uh, people older like me, little right? Plastic cases? They're a little, yeah, what's a VHS case? <laughs> right, well, There right. used to be the little cassette you'd stick into this big machine to play videos, right? So that's what I, uh, I used to then. I bought a whole crap load of those and uh then i used to package them in that i'm calling shenanigans though i looked on bgg while you were talking and i can't find yeah. an ultimate game on, on under dr finn's games uh go ho it's called go oh, go no i did see go ho okay let me go back That's and it. check that out okay. all right <laughs> <laughs> oh you got me curious because i could not find a game on this and then now you're telling there it, oh there you know what when it said the ultimate card game i was thinking you know, the ultimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Game. No, no, yeah. No, you, no, you're tricky there, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> tricky. 
So, uh, so I made scripts and scribes is what Biblios was called. Sure, and somehow sure. one of these like hundred copies that I made ended up in France at the time when this company Yellow, which you may yeah. know Yellow, that, you know, they're yeah, a big sure. company now. King of Tokyo, a million yeah, yeah. games. But uh, this is a fun fact for everyone to know. Biblios was their first game. You, I did not know that. Yeah. That's inter- so, that is interesting. So uh, they got in touch with me and said, we want, we, we're going into the, the game making business. You know, they used to make toys or something. I'm not sure. And so their first strategy game was uh, Biblios. Two of the guys in the crew to gumbo, two of them, not one, but two, when they found out you were going to be on the show, instantly said, holy cow. Biblios, the game we've been trying to get you to play. I've never, I haven't <laughs> played Biblios, but I really want to play it. And uh, both uh, Gordon and Carlos own it and play it. So uh, one of these days, I, I definitely need to get it. Hey, it's a live show, and I want to, uh, I want to say hello to Steve O'Rourke, who's checking in. I think you know Steve. Yeah. Oh, hey, Steve. Steve says hello, guys. Looking forward to yeah. a good show. Good. So that's good. Yeah. So go ho. It's I. I got to be honest, I didn't know it. It fits right in your category. It's a two-player game, 30 minutes, and a weight of 2.0. The production value, not quite as high as Biblios that I remember. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, well, started you, it started you on the big route. And, hey, I'm not the only fair. one. Steve O'Rourke says, wow, did not know that about Biblios being Yellow's first game. Yeah, that, is, yeah. that is very interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. Go ho. So there is one. And you said there is another one that's been under production, another ultimate game? Well, no, I mean, I know there's two other people that have made it. I, it may not have even ended up on Board Game Geek, but uh, I, I found it on, you know, I, someone sent it around. I, you know, I saw, I got a link from someone. I think it's it's a, someone in like Norway or something is, has made a game, but then someone else was making a new uh, board game as well. So the answer to the question, quiz time, golf, capture the flag, or ultimate, is that all None. three of them have games? All three of them have, yeah, all three have games. So one of the things I'm always curious about when I talk to designers and, and publishers, of course, is play testing. I've, I've gotten a chance to play test some games, uh, games that came out in Kickstarter or games that just came out. Wordsy was one of those by by uh, my buddy Gil yeah. Hobo. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, just I've enjoyed that aspect of seeing a game come to life. What is Dr. Finn's game's philosophy about uh, playtesting? You know, what's the process for you guys, for you? Uh, well, I just try to playtest games as much as I can. When you have I, a regular group that, that, that you work on, or does this well, go out? Well, Gil, you know, Gil's, the uh, there's a group in New York City that, you know, I know Gil, so I go and see him uh, every so often. It's a little harder for me to get into New York City because I'm, out, I'm outside the city, you know, I've sure. got an hour long train ride, et cetera. But um, there's that. I have two boys. They're 10 and 8, oh, 11 and perfect. 9. Sorry, 11 and 9. <laughs> and they, uh, they're a lot of times my audience. I have a regular group of friends that I play games with. But I, a lot of times I'll not force them to play my games. So I'll just pick and choose the, the right times. But I have enough people around that I do it. I'll also play by myself sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll set it up and then sure. I'll just sit and move around the table, right? Uh, and so it's play test just it's all the time. Once I get a thought in my head, it's like, and I'm starting to play the game. All I want to do is play it because uh, the the great thing about play testing is, or really about game design, is it's a constant series of puzzles of like, all right. Something right here is not fitting exactly, you know, because I want it to be able to a little bit more streamlined or this element's not working. So I love I actually love that part of it. It's a constant solving of puzzles. It's kind of like a game itself, you know. What what specific feedback are you looking for from playtesters? It depends on the stage at which the game is in. Sometimes I'll, you know, like the concept. Is this just a good concept, generally okay. speaking? So that's kind of early in the process. Uh, early right? in the process, like, is this going to work? And then, but by the end, I'm I'm just asking very specific questions, like, uh, like right now, I'm on Waters of Nereus, which is one of the games I'm going to be kickstarting soon. Um, I'm at the point where it's like, should this be three gold or two gold? This action, and is this power just a little too strong? How do I make it weak? You know. And a lot of times with, well, with simple games, because a lot of my games are fairly simple, so that 
making a small change here won't have a lot of major reverberations throughout. But right now, one of the games I'm working on, if I just change the gold value of one action, you know, you have to, you can pay money to, to perform actions. But if you just change it from two to three, it could really impact like, all right, now how, now how do I get gold? And like now the purser who gives out gold, is that too much money or is that not enough? So it's a constant like just trying to figure out tweaking little things, you know, like how can I, do I need to change this? So that, so it starts with proof of concept. Is this concept good? And then, you know, is the main ideas working? And then finally at the end, it's kind of like, all right, what do I do with all these tiny little specific things? And then also through the whole process is not necessarily about the mechanics, but because I self publish, I'm also thinking about components and like, all right, how can I reduce the number of components? Okay. How can I, you know, make a punch board? For example, how can I design a punch board? Tonight I spent like three hours designing a punch board. And the way that I design the punch board might actually impact the game. Because how many tokens can I fit on this board, which is going to go in the box? <laughs> right. So I actually changed, I just went back and I changed the board of one of my games because I realized the punch board was one token too short. So I took oh. off a token spot on the board, um, which seems funny, but you know, it's like that, that happens as well. Yeah. So I, I design uh, thinking of, I start oftentimes, what's the box size? What am I going to work with? And then I'll design the game around the box size. You've got the puzzle <laughs> of the game and its mechanics, and you've got the puzzle of getting the cardboard into the box. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the puzzle of how, you know, the artwork, how do you present the whole thing and package it? There's all that. So as an independent, you know, because I, I publish all my own games. I sell my own, all my own games. I distribute my own games. I, you know, I basically do everything. Uh, so... All of it is just a, a series of various puzzles and questions and trying to figure out what's the best way to ship things, what's the best way to get them from China to my, you know, to the United States, et cetera. BJ from Board Game Gumbo, from, from Board Game Gumbo Live, I've got my guest here, Steve Finn from Dr. Finn's Games. We're talking playtesting, we're talking games. Speaking of games, since Gen Con, has there been a, a game that's really hit? There's been a lot of games that have come out since Gen Con. I last count over 950 different games. I know you're busy with the two games we're going to be talking about in a little while, but has there been a game experience you've had since Gen Con that has really uh, knocked your socks off? Knocked my socks off. Knocked, that's a very strong term for me. Okay. I like games. I like games. Uh, very rarely am I, like, blown away or get my not. You know, it's like. Really? I like games. Like I, I never fall in love with a game because I'm constantly playing new games and I get bored very easily. Uh, uh, okay. Like there's a lot of games that I think are great. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm very, you know, I'm like, oh, good. I'm really excited. But I have so, you know, I, I own a lot of games, you know, like many people sure. who are collectors. And I have a ton of games. But, you know, more re I could talk about some of the games that I've recently played. Like uh, I got a Kickstarter for uh, what's it called? The King's Road. Okay. A Reiner Knitz Knitzia game. Sure. Recently got that. It's a good, good, solid Reiner Knitzia it's game. Like it's like most of his games. It's, it's nice. Good it's nice. Yeah, solid. it's good. Uh, <laughs> Master of Orion, the board game. My son Orion uh, was very excited to see that there was a, a board game with his name. That's kind of a fun little game that we've been playing. Uh, I'm curious, that, you know, based on what you just said, uh, though. But, yeah. Uh, besides games that you've designed. Yeah. What's the one game you've played the most? Ooh, what's the one game I've played the most? <laughs> that you think? Uh, I, it yeah, doesn't yeah, have to be yeah. exact, but what do you think? Right. Well, I, I, I play a lot of games by Stefan Feld. Okay. So I played, uh, my son and I, for it was a while there, we were playing Roma. Okay. Uh, if you've seen Roma. Uh, that was tough it, to find, man. I, you, yeah. you must have, yeah, you got a copy early then, because that's, it's that's a, been you know, a tough it's a two player dice and card game. Sure. I played that with my son a, a lot. I mean, just a ton. Uh, and so I think that's one of the older ones that I've played. I, I am part of a gaming group that we are always playing new games. Okay. Um, and it's rare that we just play the same games over. But I'll tell you some of the classic games that I like. I like uh, El Grande, I would say, is a game that I'll always play. Do you know El Grande? 
Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, El Grande is one that I always pull out. Uh, Castles of Burgundy, I sure. like a lot. Another so, Feld game. Another Feld game, you know. And I have a lot of Knizia games, you know. The games that, The lighter games would be like... Lost Cities. Uh, High Society. Okay. Played a ton of uh, Las Vegas. Modern Art. Like a lot. Modern Art. I have Modern Art. I haven't played it a lot, though, you know. But so I play a lot of those games. So games that have come out recently that I have to say there was one game that I've already, you know, we've played it a lot now, but Ponzi Scheme. Oh, yeah. Was a I game like it a lot. Uh, that came out. I am not really heavily into the theme. That is. Themes. Not, no, no, I'm not. In, I'm, no, sorry. Normally speaking, I'm not into themes. I don't okay. care that much about the theme. I don't feel like I'm getting enraptured in this world, et cetera. Like, that's just not the way that I play games. To me, every game is about pushing little cubes around or you need playing to play cards. With a gumbo. You'd feel What's, the theme with us. We we really that? get into the theme if you theme, ever play yeah, with the gumbo so, guys. Yeah, yeah. So I mean I'm I'm constantly being accused of just having pasted on themes. <laughs> I admit it, I'm guilty. <laughs> Hang me. What did you like uh, about I, Ponzi scheme? I played Ponzi scheme probably three that, or four but times. Here, that, that was my point. Ponzi scheme, I actually feel like I'm in a Ponzi scheme. True. Like I really that's the only game I swear that I've ever felt like immersed in the theme where I feel like I'm doing it. You know, I don't feel like I'm in France when I'm playing Carcassonne. You know, I don't yeah. feel like I'm in outer space when I'm playing Master of Orion or uh, you know, Roll for the Galaxy or right. Right. you know, or any of those things. Those, you know, they might have all the art and and things like that and the names, et cetera, but it's not not that important to me. Steve O'Rourke checking in. BJ from Board Game Gumbo, Gumbo Live. I have Dr. Steve Finn in here. Steve says, Ultimate will be the new Pirates or Vikings. So we're always joking around about the overused themes. All right. <laughs> Steve, I just read that because I hadn't read it before. So I'm, I'm reading it while I'm reading it, and now I'm getting the joke. <laughs> That's a good one, Steve. O'Rourke. The name father always has a zinger. Ultimate's going to be the next Pirates or Vikings or Zombies uh, O'Rourke. It could have been yeah. Zombies there. Nice one, though. And he also says a necessary field trip, New York to L.A. I don't. I don't Louisiana? Where are you? Oh, from I guess where? Louisiana. Okay. So Louisiana? I was thinking he was thinking. <laughs> like, that in y, so. like, or like New York to L.A., California. I don't know. I don't Los know. Angeles. I think he's I talking about Louisiana. I think he's talking about Louisiana. Yeah. He, he's yeah. been, we've, I've been, we joke around with each other and I'd love to get him to come down and play because we, we have similar uh, taste in games. So I think we'd have a good time if you play with the Critic Gumbo. We do. We do, for the most part, get really into our, the theme of our game. If we're playing viticulture, somebody yeah. is out there trying to grow wine. And uh, the last time I played, I actually went with a strategy that Jamie st- <laughs> Steve, Steve says, yes, Louisiana, of course. Sorry yeah. for that, Steve. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I played – the last time I played, Jamie Stegmeyer hates the strategy, but I played without trying to grow wine or I, actually without trying to sell wine. Oh. Uh, to do the strategy, you do have to grow some wine and put it into a bottle, but but you never sell it. And so the whole time I played the game, I played as this idiot guy that would start his fields up and then sell them and start the field up and plant grapes and then sell the grapes. And, you know, it's just I, I guess you had to be there. But uh, we do try to get into themes of the games. Now, look, so, some of the games like Ponzi Scheme, there's no real theme for it other than the fact that you you really feel the tension of, yeah. of when that loan is coming due in two spaces and you're worried about somebody doubling up on the jump. I'm sure you've seen that happen. Right. Uh, that's what a tense. I mean, it's got such delicious decisions in that game. It just drives me crazy. What a good game. Yeah. It's a fun game. You know, and the, mm-hmm. and the, the secret bit, you know, uh, offers that are going around. That's oh, a real the, fun part of the game too. The, the, that, you know, that mechanic. Like where you, you're like, sell something to one person for $5 and then like, buy it for four you know like oh nice i just made a buck you know? no i agree yeah. and and especially since everyone else at the table is staring at the other two players right. wondering if those yeah. guys got a better deal than i did when yeah. i traded with that guy yeah, yeah it's uh, good stuff. what i wish more people talked about ponzi scheme that's a game that just doesn't get a lot of uh love or talk and it's it's a great like it's we talked about game. fillers later on it's a great filler game yeah yeah i think it's a little more than a filler but yeah it's a you know it's a, a medium I would call it medium. Well, that length. that comes to my next question. I guess it depends on how many people. If you're playing that with five people, it's going to take an hour. 
Yeah, that's my next question. Uh, and something I talked about, there's a really cool um, a Facebook group called um, uh, Gateway Games and Filler Games run by a guy yeah. named Chuck Yeager. Not not the Chuck Yeager, but a Chuck Yeager. And he does a really good job of encouraging people that are just getting into the hobby to look at games. Yeah. And uh, we got into a little a discussion with one of the guys on that forum. What is a filler? How do you define a filler? Well, I, th- I mean, I think the word is coming from where you're uh... – filling the space between two longer games, you know, like that you just have a few minutes you want to play. So for me, filler is really about time. It's not necessarily about how intricate a game is. It could be a really complicated game that you could play in five minutes. I mean, there aren't many out there. Uh, But I would say 20 minutes, 25 minutes is where you have the filler game. And then there's gateway or casual games where I think the rules are fairly easy to understand, but that that could last anywhere from, you know, 10 minutes to probably 45 minutes. I think when you start breaking the 45 minutes to an hour, then I think casual gamers are going to start to kind of drift away. Uh, I like I like what you're saying. I, when I think of a filler, I, I think in terms of a temporal phase, you know, yeah. 20 to 30 minutes, something like that. At least that, that's the way I look at it. Five to 30 minutes, 30 at the outset. When I talked to Mike Ritchie about it, he's the designer over at Rather Dashing Games. And he said he hates the word filler because the games that Rather Dashing designs, probably like yours, are games that you can play not just as a quick five or 10 or 15 or 20 minute game between the two big games. They actually have enough meat on the bones, even though they're short, that you can play them for an hour or two hours or three hours for an entire night. They, they've had game nights where they play one or two filler games all night. And I started right. thinking about it. We've done the same things with uh, Where Words, our uh, New York artist. We start as, oh, look, there's a bunch of guys. We'll wait for the next game. And the next thing you know, we played the game for an hour and a half, you know, right. just over and over. So he said this, today's fillers can be played and enjoyed for hours at a time. They're not just one shot between games. What do you think? If it's a good filler game, then yeah, that's correct. Uh, I think, see, it depends on the, what that what you really want to call a filler. If you are, have a light filler, um, then no, you don't want to play that multiple times in a row. If you have a good meaty filler that you're making really good, interesting decisions, or like, you know, the werewolf games, which is more like party games where a lot of people are playing at once, and it's really easy to go and keep playing it. Like, uh, I have a hard time, for example, playing, uh, what's that called, Love Letter? No, like, I don't really? Think, no, no, I mean, I don't think I could play Love Letter for two hours. Oh, no, no, probably not. No, but I could play Love Letter for 10 minutes. Yeah. And maybe play it again. But I don't want to play it five times, right? No. But there could be some shorter games that I do like a lot that I could play four or five times in a row. I've played No Thanks. Which only like takes no five or ten minutes. That, that could be fun. You could play. I could play that up maybe two or three times. Especially yeah. as people are dropping in and dropping out, moving yeah. to another game. You move people in. Hey, Steve agrees with us on time. He says, "I agree on time, but I think a lot of folks think of filler the same way you might in a bad sausage, right. not real meat, and somehow less than real games." Yeah. yeah see, I, I, go ahead. No, no. I think I think that's right, and I and sometimes I do think it's kind of. One of these marketing problems, there's another problem that I have because I also do my own marketing. But it's like, you know, Rado calls me the king of the filler. And I'm proud of that. However, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to play a filler game because it does, for some people, have the connotation that it doesn't have much meat. It's not really fulfilling. But see, What's that's what good- I'm trying to break. You know, my games, I think they're all the, all the short ones have a lot going on in a short amount of time. And so I'm hoping that my games are one of those. I know Biblios, for many people, they have played, you know, like three or four times in a row. No, Carlos has specifically told me Biblios is a big game in a small package in small yeah. time. I mean, that's what he calls it. It's, it's a big game, big decisions, lots of interesting choices to make just in a small package and small amount of time. I love those kind of games. Well, give it a try. I'll tell you this, though. The first time you play it, you'll – you have no idea what to do. You have to play it like two or three times to get it. Yeah. You know, so sometimes like people will, pe- reviewers who often just like play a game once, they're like, oh, you know, this game isn't so good. But the game really, I think, I mean, a lot of games, they're great the first time you play. This one has a lot of subtlety in it and it has a lot to do with the way other people are playing. And 
it's not just like you can go in with one strategy. You have to see the way other people are playing and react to them. BJ from Board Game Gumbo, Gumbo Live, episode number 24. I have my guest here, Steve Finn from Dr. Steve, Dr. Finn's Games. Steve, you were telling me that over uh, in 2018, you've got a double Kickstarter coming up. Tell me about the games and uh, what can we expect out of Dr. Finn Games coming up in Q1 2018? All right. So I have two games. One is called Cosmic Run Regeneration. Now, this is going to be a... That was one of the earliest games, right? Well, Cosmic, Cosmic Run? Run was. Okay. Then I made a game called Cosmic Run Rapid Fire, which is a two-player roll and write game. Uh, but now this next Cosmic Run is going to be a remake of the original. But it has so many different rule changes that I have to give it a different name. I mean, it's at its core, it's the same game. But I've really changed some. I've made some dramatic changes. Uh, Lay them on me. What you got? All right. So, I mean, I don't know if you, you don't know Cosmic Run, so it might be difficult to say. But I'll just list some of the the things. Now, the the original game is uh, it's a, a dice rolling game. You've got five tracks which have planets at the top, and everyone has spaceships at the bottom, and you're basically racing up the tracks. Okay. Now, the first track, you can move up by putting uh, dice that have the number one on the track. So if I have a number one, uh, one pip, I could put it on the first track. The second track, you move up with pairs of dice. So I could put okay. like two fours there. And the third track, it's three of a kind. Fourth track is four of a kind. And the fifth track is five of a kind. A, you have twist, six... on, a twist on can't stop a little bit? Uh, uh, no, not really. No, it's not like that. So no what would happen is I, I roll all my dice. And then I assign them to the tracks. Now, if I'm playing conservatively, I can just, like, if I get a pair, I can put the pair on the two track and then roll the rest of the dice. So after I assign a die, I can roll whatever I have left. But I could also, like, if I have six dice and I have a pair of fives, I could put the pair of fives on the five track, which needs five of a kind, and then roll the remaining four dice, hoping that I'll keep rolling fives. So I have a push my luck to try to get all five fives on the five track or, or whatever. So in addition to the tracks, I also there's aliens. So there's alien cards that have little dice uh, icons on them. So for example, it might have a three. So if I get a die with a three, I can assign it to the alien and then earn the card, which then lets me do stuff like re-roll a die, turn a die from like a two to a three, turn a two to any number, you know, and stuff like that. So you can manipulate okay. the dice. Yeah, change the rules of the game. Yeah. Now, in the meantime, when you roll the dice in the original game, when you roll the dice, there's uh, a couple colored dice that tells you whether a meteor is going to hit one of the planets. So you're racing with other people, but also occasionally meteors hit the planets. It's a very unprotected place without an atmosphere, but you're going to get there. You know, you know, you got to stretch the imagination a little. But so the idea is you get to the planet and set up a force field, and then you can protect the planet from the meteors, and then you get there first, so you get the points. Uh, so you're racing against that, because after three hits, the planet's destroyed, and no one scores the big points from reaching the top. So the basic idea of the game, then, is roll. Do you push your luck? You know, keep rolling. Put, put dice down in different places. And uh, the, the new game has instead of five tracks as a six track but the six track has this special yellow die now that when you place the yellow die on the six track you can move the number of pips but then your turn ends so like if you roll a six on your first turn you gotta assign all the other dice so that you can use the six so you're like oh damn do i want to go on the yellow track now or do i want to use the other dice and then sometimes you might re-roll and then the yellow die shows two which wouldn't be a good time to place it. So that's one thing. The aliens, I've added a sixth alien. Also, the way that the meteors hit the planet is now card-based, so it's a lot less random. Okay. Uh, in the previous game, it was just, like, totally crazy. Like, you could just, uh, the fifth planet could be hit three times in a row at the beginning of the game and just get destroyed. Uh, so but I've now, now made it. deck, right? Yeah, now it's a deck of cards, and there's a system, a way of you prepare the deck to make sure that there's a little bit less randomness. And the game also now is speedier because there's always 
planets hit uh, always getting struck, uh, whereas before the dice might hit miss the planets. Uh, there's that also all the aliens now. I have a new way of, of trading in aliens. You could score points. Uh, in the original game, you just at the end of the game you just turn in your cards. But now with your alien cards during the game, you turn them in, and you're racing to score for sets. So if you're the first person to get five different aliens, for example, you score 20 points, whereas the next person will score 15, and the next oh. person will score 10. So now there's also a race for the aliens. So that is a huge, I mean, it's actually, it's a very huge change. Also, there used to be multiple use cards, but now everything is a single shot. Uh, well, also, is, all of the have, artwork, what's that? Yeah, why have you gotten away from the multi-use cards? You, well, see, because I wanted to, I wanted to increase that. See, with the uh, the the cards that used to have multiple uses, they would have numbers on the edge, so go one, two, three, four, and then you just turn it. There might be some card games you might know like that. So when yeah. you have two uses left, it's you turn it. Yeah. Uh, so the reason I got rid of that was because I wanted people to race to use their cards to turn them in to get to the the points first. But then also, uh, it, it just made it more elegant. Now you just get a card, you use it, you flip it over, and then it's done. Oh, there wasn't okay. like spinning the cards around, and sometimes you might knock it. Oh, did I forget to spin it? Did I not spin it? It's very sure. easy. You use it, you flip it over, and it's done. So, so that was like a, a little bit of a streamline. Cosmic this is run, Cosmic Run Regeneration. Regeneration. And when are you yeah. expecting it to come out? That will be kickstarted in February. And probably coming out the end of the summer. Okay. Now, at the same time, I'm going to kickstart a game called Waters of Nereus. So there's okay. going to be one Kickstarter with two games. And you've done that before with multiple games. I in have your never Christmas. done this before. Maybe it's a whole new world for me. One of your Kickstarters, maybe was the was there an option of being able to purchase other games? Maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's always an option. Okay. That's uh, what I remembered then. Right, yeah. So, no, you can always – I have combos, and you can do add-ons and all this kind of stuff. Sure. My so tell me about Waters of New Ra- Waters of Nureus. Nureus. It's Nureus. a It's a, it's a, a not, not well-known Greek god of okay. water. <laughs> yeah, so, I uh it's a fantasy water world. This is going to be one of my more involved games. And you're moving a, a ship around to collect uh, what are essentially little gemstones. But they're going to be like, I don't know, thematically, they're going to be some sort of like treasures that have all sorts of restorative and healing powers. And uh, is Kevin they're very Costner valuable. Involved? What's that? Is Kevin Costner involved? No, Kevin Costner. <laughs> but you uh, said water world, so. Yeah, yeah, it's not Waterworld, but it, it is a, essentially like, so it's a, but the the thing about this game is you have, or the theme of it is you're moving around, pick up treasures. Everyone has a, a crew of seven people and you have cards and you simultaneously, yeah, see, uh, let me just stop here. Steve is is chiming in. Waters of Nereus is the Rondell game. So I want to tell him. He's play tested, right? Yeah, but see, it, it used to be a Rondell game. Ah, Okay. I, it's funny. I started saying, I want to make a Rondell game. And I started making it. And then I didn't, I ended up, I got rid of the Rondell. <laughs> I don't have the Rondell anymore. Well, now What's you have the, a chance. The Rondell is you have these seven action cards. Everybody chooses an action at the same time and reveals it. And then, depending on what crew member you picked, uh, if you're the first person to play that particular crew member, you get a better power. It's a little bit like, you know, uh, broom service. Yeah, sure, sure. It, it doesn't have that real screw you. You know, everyone still gets to, you know, gets to do an action. You but if you're the first person to do it, it's a little better. Okay. So there's a little bit of a, a fighting over who's going to get the best version of each of the crew members. How you close know, is do- the game? How close is the game ready for production? Because oh, Alex Reichman... Alex wants to know if there's any chance you could get the license for Waterworld <laughs> and rethink the game. Alex, is this one? Is this one of your favorite <laughs> Kevin Costner movies? <laughs> I do not want to even try to get a license for Waterworld. I'm sorry. Yep. I actually right. tried to get the license for the um, for Harry Potter. I never got a response back. Yeah, my little company. Pro- they never yeah, replied back. To me, yeah. You know? 
That's but I mean, you'd think they'd at least send a, an email back, right? Yeah. I was at like, dear something. Universal, I have an independent game publishing company, blah, blah, blah. Can you please, yes, the show at Universal Studios is tremendous. <laughs> BJ from Board Game Gumbo, we're talking, we're talking about War World, I guess, with the Alex Goldsmith show. But I also have as much <laughs> guest steve finn from dr finn's games <laughs> thank you for chiming in alex big 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 <laughs> fan of Waterworld. <laughs> you were telling me about your new game waters of right. Moraes, waters not of the rondo version right so it's uh it's got a lot going on it's not my typical game uh but you move around you pick up treasures and then you use those you have a cabin with all your crew members and you're paying them off with certain treasures to score points uh, all of the cards, there's special science cards that allow you to do a special thing. I'm not, I'm not reading that comment that just came up because I don't know if I want to laugh or not. I assume it was funny. Was it funny? Uh, oh, yeah, we, Alex and I have an ongoing bet because uh, we've never actually seen the real Steve O'Rourke. Uh, he doesn't post any pictures of himself on Facebook. It's always pictures of his two kids. Have we ever seen Steve Finn and Steve O'Rourke in the same place at the same time? I That's cannot confirm it. You can uh, confirm, you know, neither confirm the, nor the deny. Way, the way that I play test with him is uh, he told me to drop the game off uh, and I give him the rules. <laughs> Steve's in on the joke. That's a good one. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> All right. So what is an Arias is not a Rondell game. It has, it's nothing not a Rondell with, game. It, it has nothing to do with Kevin Costner. And we do think Steve O'Rourke has play tested it, but it was a really early version. Very early version. Uh, no, it's it's dramatically different. It's not the same game he played. So, uh, you know, this is another thing that happens. Games can – a lot of my games start, and they basically are kind of the same all the way through. Some of them, though, like just go wildly off in totally new directions, and that was one of them. Or is this still going to fit under your ma mantra of, you know, filler games that have – I mean, what's the time it's limit? It's not a what's... filler game. This is, no, uh, you know, this is uh, – 50, 45 minutes to an hour. It depends on how, you know, like with me and my friends, we play like this, uh, any, you know, any game. So I can pound out a game that says an hour in 30 minutes usually. Right. Uh, but anyone with analysis paralysis, you know, this game could go probably an hour and 10 minutes at the most. But the, the options, there are not so many options. It's not like it, it's, there's not like so many things you can do. Do you uh, have anybody in your game group that's got AP, a little AP pro? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've got some AP friends. So what do you do? It's such uh, a tough question. Yeah, no, we, you know, I, I like them. They're such, they're actually really good friends of mine. So I just deal with it. You know, we make fun of them. And you know, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, it's, yeah, just stuff like this. <laughs> Maybe a little timer through the Jeopardy theme, you know, da -da -da -da, you know, stuff like that. Sure, somebody will play it on their phone. So is that one of the reasons why you're bringing in both games together as a double Kickstarter? Because this is a little bit of leap of faith for you on this game? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I mean, I don't have any problem. I wouldn't say this is a leap of faith. I mean, I've had a, another game of mine, Foragers, was sure. longer, a little heavier than my normal game. And even Cosmic Run was is not a super quick, I, mean, I guess, depending. It could be a quick filler game as well, but... It stretches a little. Uh, no, the reason I'm doing it is to save money. <laughs> okay. Because I, well, it's actually to save me money and to save my backers money. There is a lot of people that consider my games to be an insta back. So okay. I don't know. There's probably like 250, 300 people in your Hall of Fame. In my yeah, in my group, in my back backstart Kickstarter backers that I know they're going to back it. They're just going to do it. And then there's probably another 150 that are ready. If it's not, if it's getting close to the to the uh, funding goal, they're ready to jump on board. So I probably have at, at least 500 people that will will back a game. So I'm usually not too worried about succeeding. I mean, I've had 12, 11, whatever it is, 12 successful Kickstarter campaigns. So I usually, and also I don't have a huge funding goal usually, and uh, because there's multiple games that you can buy, people can pick up my old games, and that helps towards raising money for this game. So no, but the but I can have them shipped at the same time from China. I can have them. Oh yeah, I want to say that right. Uh, 
I can have them shipped at the same time from China, and then I can ship them to the backers at the same time. So I'll have a level that basically, you know, you get five or 10 bucks off for getting both at the same time. Steve says he's seen the art and the artem. This looks quite lovely. Continue for waters of Nereus. For waters yeah, of Nereus, so, of course, yeah. So I don't know Continue if you know Beth Sobel. Beth Sobel yeah, is, a, is a winning plan, right? Yeah, do you know Beth Sobel? I've never met, met her, but I love her artwork. Viticulture, yeah, 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 yeah. she knocked it right, out of the park so, with Viticulture. Right, and there's Oh, yeah, Herbaceous, herbaceous right? Okay, yeah. yeah. That's her. That's uh, she did that game. So this is a one of my games as well, but I didn't publish it. Uh, but she did That's the artwork for first, that. Right. That is pencil first games. Yeah. 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 Um, but Beth, also, you know, she's done Lan- Lanterns was another really pretty game that she did a lot. Of, yeah, she's done a lot of games. Uh, uh, Alex says but, Fox in the Forest. Fox I mean, the, uh, the list of games she's done over the last couple of years. I mean, they're all phenomenal. Yeah. So, I mean, the art for Waters of Nereus is just great. It's the first time also where I've had like, if I've like in Cosmic Run, I have six different alien types. So I use six, six illustrations. But with Waters of Nereus, every person has their own crew. So now I have 28 different illustrations. And, you know, like those, those are the kind of touches that I'm getting better at. Wow, this is some good looking stuff. I'm really, I'm really, I'm look, I'm yeah. on your BG page on that. Very nice, oh, okay. man. Yeah, Beth's doing some really nice stuff, and also the artwork uh, on my Cosmic Run is really coming. It's all upgraded artwork. It looks great too. I'm really. Well, actually, I, actually, I wasn't. I, I think on the BGG I'm really page. getting excited about that. What's that? Yeah, I wasn't on the BGG page because uh, the BGG page needs some uh, images. Don't see anything on there. Yeah, I don't have a lot of stuff for Waters of Nereus up there yet. Okay. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Yeah, so have, 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 do you work with? She's kind of notorious uh, about working over the internet. Have you worked? Have you met her in person, or do you do everything over the internet? Yeah, no, I, I, I have not met any of the people that have done my art in person. Half of them, I mean, most of them live outside the country. Ah. You know, uh, I, I've worked with people in England. Uh, where is Georgia? I, Italy. Uh, Argentina and Brazil. What what stands out for you? Is it something emotional or is it something thematic? What what is it when you're looking at art for as as part of the elements of your games? See, this is a part of the uh, part of this whole process that I'm still trying to get better at is the presentation. Um, and when I was starting, you know, earlier in my career as a game designer. Uh, as an independent publisher, I should say, it, it's challenging because the good art costs a lot of money. Uh, sure. And so I don't want to say that my first few games weren't good because I still think for the amount of money I paid, I got a good product. Uh, but I think as I see more and more how good people can really be, I understand like that good art costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I think I, not, I, I don't want to say Beth, you know, it's like, oh my God, Beth is, you know, charging me too much. She's not. I think what she's doing is reasonable for her, how, how good it is, you know? So uh, that's what, I forgot what your question was. <laughs> no, just, what, what is art, it, right? So, yeah, when you see the elements or, or an art, oh. are you looking at, are you looking at typical art? That, that no, people see, yeah. to you. What are you looking for? Yeah, no, like, I, you know, I'm kind of like easy. I'm easy. I okay. care so much about the mechanics that I just basically say, how does this look? Well, it looks good. You know, it looks, looks good enough to me. But when I see something that's beautiful, I say, oh, yeah, wow, that's great. That's really going to work. You know, but in the past, I've just said, oh, that looks nice. That's good. It looks professional. That's really kind of all I wanted. Uh, but now you have to have something that really stands out with all of the competition of games. Uh, and I also realized, like, I got to my first big convention at PAX Unplugged. And whenever I had a, one of my, like, prettier games out on a table, boom, people came and sat down and wanted to play it. Uh, and I could see the appeal. But see, for me, that's not something as a game player. I want it to look nice and I want nice parts. But I'm not like just I'm not going to be overwhelmed by, oh, my God, this is such great art. Do you bling yeah, out like, yeah, your favorite games? Nice. What's that? Do you ever bling out your favorite games? 
bling out my games? Yeah. No. <laughs> you, know, do you know what I'm I talking about? So is, I've got a buddy that's got Scythe by uh, Stonemaier Games. Yeah. And he owns every single thing, even third party, that you can get for Scythe. I don't oh, actually know. Oh, yeah, know. bling out. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, the, the extra, like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, don't I don't even do know how that. much that Scythe kit that we're playing on because the meeples are all upgraded. The, right. the, yeah, the yeah. resources are all upgraded. He's got he's got everything for it. I mean, and like he says, when I find a game, when he, he says, when I find a game I like, I just want to, you know, make it look as pretty as possible. Yeah. Uh, have you ever, have you I ever done I mean, that? I'm not against that, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of money to do that. You know, for me, the game that I like, is the mechanics you know like it can have bad art with good mechanics and i'm happy if it has crappy mechanics and beautiful art i hate it i don't want to play it i don't care how pretty it looks let's see what and then steve ideally says. you get both steve says her art and he's talking about beth of course is one of the few that will make me consider a game based just on the look i want my games yeah. fun but all things being equal i'd also like them beautiful so a mixture of fun and beautiful right right yeah, yeah, and as a now as a person, you know, as a business person who is trying to make this, you know, make a next step, I have to do this. But I haven't cared, you know. Like I had a, I had in the past. It's always been a part time thing for me, and it still is a part time thing for me. And I do it because I enjoy it, and I do like extra income for sure. Uh, and I wouldn't, you know, I, it'd be a lot of time if I wasn't making any, a little bit of money for, on the side sure. from this, right? I mean, it is a business thing. It's a business. Uh, but I didn't care so much, like, if I sold 1,000 or 10. I didn't care that much uh, because I was enjoying it. Now I just see, like, oh, with, with a little bit more effort, I can actually exponentially make the game both very mechanically sound and pretty. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and my business, because it's growing, I can now take a little bit more chances with the amount of money I put up front so I can pay for better art, I can pay for better graphic design, et cetera. Well, based on what I've seen on some of these games that you've had recently, uh, I mean, you're getting that sweet spot of good mechanics and good art. Hey, we've been talking a lot about some filler games tonight. Yeah. We talked about uh, no thanks. We talked about uh, wear words, a bunch of others. If you were, if you know, if you were running into somebody at a convention and they said, "Hey, what's a what's a great thing for me to buy for a non gamer, somebody that doesn't know a lot about games?" You got any ideas for some stocking stuffer filler type games for them? All right, so I have I have a, a pile of games here. Oh, nice. Some of them are mine. <laughs> That's some okay. Some of them are others. That's okay. So I'll start with my own games. I'm going right. to go ding Alex every time he mentions. One I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to just quickly go through some of my own games. Sure. Uh, and when you said stocking stuffer, so I went out and I just grabbed all games that I literally small games. Sure. Okay. So herbaceous, I think is probably my best, the best game to buy of mine oh, okay. for non gamers because the artwork is so lovely and it's a very easy game. It's very uh, simple to play. You could teach it in five minutes and play in 20. Perfect. Uh, That's so what we're looking for. One. Then, yeah. of course, my most popular game is Biblios. Okay. Uh, maybe, for, not for, for non- maybe not for brand new people. Okay. But, well, maybe for brand new people. But I, wouldn't, I, I don't know if I'd give this game. If you could teach them how to play it first, then that's fine. Okay, but uh, to read the rules, you know, it might be a little complicated for some people. You know, that's one of those things when you say filler games and like, or like even this here. This is not my game, but I like archaeology. Okay, have you played this game? That one? No, I haven't played that one. But even like people who never play games, they might have a hard time. What's that? Who designed that one? Uh, Phil Harding. That's Phil Harder walking. Oh yeah, I know that game. Uh, Phil Harding. Phil Harding. Okay. Yeah. Phil Harding Walker, right? Uh, it doesn't say Walker on the back, but I don't know. Okay. But like, you know, some people might be intimidated even by that. So I don't, I don't know. But I, but if, if they're relatively intelligent people, you could do that. I did pull out No Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So, sure. you know, that's a good one. 
And then here's a here's a good one. If you have kids, although this is a vicious game at its heart. You know oh, that one? Yes. yes. Hey, that's my fish. I've got this the upgraded version. Thing. You've got the little tiny box. I've got the bigger one. I got one the little the... tiny box, yeah. Uh, okay, I haven't seen that one. Oh, it's a good one. All right, I'll go back here for a two-player. This is one of mine, Slush Fund. I saw that on your website, right? It's a uh, two-player quick uh, <clears throat> area control card game. Are you a Sushi Go fan? Uh, I do like Sushi Go. That archaeology uh, card game? That's yeah. the same guy, Phil Harding Walker. Oh, he did uh, He did Sushi Go. Sushi Go, Emotep, all of those games. Yeah. Oh, but that's, okay. yeah that I is, like Emotep. That's a tough game to find. <clears throat> archaeology? Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. This is uh, from a, a lore, uh Yeah, I've had this that, for a long time. I think that was actually his very first design that came out, I mean, 10 years ago. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, still what, going on lines saying? with, with uh, here's, here's one of my new games, <clears throat> Cosmic Run oh. Rapid Fire. Sure. Okay. Uh, this is easy to play, fun for people, two-player dice game. Uh, here's another one of mine, and then I'll, I'll be done with mine very soon. The Butterfly Garden. Oh, that's a game I almost back, Steve. I almost it's a little one. bit. It's it a little bit good. like Splendor, uh, insofar as you're trying to collect <clears throat> sets of butterflies and, and beat people to certain kinds of sets. Uh, a two-player dice game, Capa de Capi, another one of mine, small. This is a fun push your luck dice chucking game. All right, so those were all my small box games. Here's another one I recently got acquired. Do you know this one? Yeah, I played both that one and Tides the, of Time. Uh, yeah, I played Tides of Time and the new one. <clears throat> There's a new Tides of Time. Yeah, they made one with the Cthulhu mythos over it. Oh so, yeah, yeah. You remember well, whenever you play? I won't be buying that one. Okay, <laughs> you're not a Cthulhu fan. <laughs> whenever you play your cards, you also have to worry because some of the cards can instill madness in you. So you have to trade. You got to make that uh, juicy decision. Am I going to play this card knowing that I might get madness back? So yeah, yeah, it's, an, it's an alternate lose condition is to get too much madness. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I mean, filler. I like this game. Fun little. Very I mean, good. you know, it's not. It's a filler, easy. There you go. Uh, I got a couple more. Actually, it, do you know this one? The Builders? I've heard of it. I have not played it, though. No. The Builders I Middle Ages. This is a, it's, it's, again, a little bit like uh, Splendor. Okay. But I like it because you can. It fits in this tiny box, and it has some good, good stuff going on. You're, it's basically you're building. You're getting resources to buy cards, uh, and then getting sets of things. And Alex wanted good. to correct me. Oh. It's Walker Harding, and apparently I kept saying Harding Walker. Walker. But at least Alex, at least I got the, right. I got the, uh, the right. How <laughs> many people out there besides me and you know archaeology? Not too many people. Not too many. Oh, and that's another game that he designed, Baron Park. If you haven't played Baron Park, oh, I, I like Baron Park. That's the same guy. So I, I, I like this guy then because yeah. I like Imhotep. I like Baron. I like Baron Park a lot. I've played yeah. that game. And then, do you know Citadels? Yes, I'm. That's one of the f few Bruno games I'm not a fan of. You're it's, not a fan of. I'll it's, tell you this. It's I good. I like Libertalia. No, no, I'll play Libertalia. I will never play this anymore because okay. I am sick of it. Okay. However. I think for other people who have not played it, they should play this. They should give it a try a couple times, get you know, and see what's like. Because I don't, I would not play this though with the whatever it goes up to six people. Yeah, that drives me nuts. It takes too way too long. If but I'm I think with like three or four people, I like it. If I'm going to play a game with that mechanic, I'm going to play Libertalia. I I just like Libertalia. Yeah, see, I don't know that game. Yeah. But see, yeah, so a, a couple of these games I'm sick of, I don't want to ever play. And to be honest, I don't ever want to play this again. But that give doesn't mean it's not a good game. Give them to Steve uh, O'Rourke. What's that? I said give them to Steve O'Rourke. Oh, give them to Steve O'Rourke. <laughs> it doesn't mean I want to give them away. Because <laughs> I'll still have other people play it. Sometimes I'll play it just to show other people because I do think it's a good classic game. This is not for a filler fun game, but I do like it because it's small. Oh, well, you know, we play that as a filler. That's one of the things that we play right at the start of the night. La Granja, No Siesta. Project Dice Game, No Siesta. I, I don't know it. if it's filler, though. Yeah, see that? That, to me, takes a little longer. It's going to take a little longer, 20 minutes. 
So I just went and I grabbed some some of my smaller box games. I'm going to time it the, next time we play. It seems it. like it's right at that 20-minute mark, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe, yeah, they're maybe saying 30-plus. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe it is I'm 30 wrong. minutes. Maybe it is. Oh, I, I love No Siesta. You know, it took me – you know what it was? The la- I, I don't play this enough, and every time I play it, I have to kind of reread the rules. And so I think I'm getting that confused. But that, to me, is not a casual gamer game. Because that would, you know, like you ever gave that to someone, they'd never be able to read the rules and get through it. No, no, no. It's not no. one I would uh, bring out. I got a couple for you. See if you played them. Uh, some of them right on the border. Have you played Celestia? No. Push You You like push your luck mechanics, it sounds like. You, you, you were familiar do, with generally. Yeah. yeah. Can't stop. You know, you're familiar with some I of like those can't ones. stop, yeah. Yeah. Celestia takes that push your luck mechanic uh, and uh, it's just, a, it's you know, the theme is, is just kind of pasted on, but it's it's taking a trip and trying to score as many points as you can going out. But everybody's together, unlike Can't Stop, where everybody's individually trying to score points. Everybody's together in the same ship, and you're deciding okay. whether to jump out now or keep rolling. So, all right, it's a good one. There's a new game uh, from Brain Games called Game of Trains. I love little box card games like No Thanks or any any of those. I've got four or five of those games. They all fit in that same uh, six nymphed No Thanks style little box. Yep. Yeah, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, Game no, of I know Trains, what I'm talking about. Yeah, Game of Trains fits in that. It takes two minutes to teach, and you play it in about 10 minutes. And it's just a fun little uh, number card game where you're trying to, you know, take cards from each other and set up all your cards in a ro- in a in a line. So, but how do you feel about Colorado? Game. I have like never the played Colorado one. Yeah, yeah. Do you know Zuloretto though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, well, I know both play Zuloretto with cards. Yeah. I haven't played either one of them. I actually gave Zuloretto to my niece, and I was supposed to teach it to her. I need to get around to uh, teaching it to her, so I haven't played it yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I think Zuloretto is great for a casual game to give to people. I was right. Steve says you can drop off any of those unwanted games at the pre-agreed-upon, undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. The last one I'm going to throw out there is one uh, that has come out every month since I was able to get this off of BGG. A fake artist goes to New York. Have you played that one yet? No. Oh, look, there's, there's Alex Goldsmith throwing one out there. It's same, same, we're on the same wavelength. Uh, three games. I played two of those three, Deep Sea Adventure and Fake Artist Goes to New York. I haven't played Insider, although I've played Where Words. They're similar games, although from what I can tell, uh, Where Words is more up my alley. But uh, those Oink games, they come in a box this big. Yeah. And what's amazing about those games is even though the box is this big, the well, – the, experience you get is a lot bigger well i i know deep sea adventure okay but wait is i i played that like that was like a a japanese game i think i oink played is, yeah oink is a japanese company that's a japanese company yeah, yeah so okay so i didn't know if it was a republished version of it but if no play i played deep, deep sea, sea adventure. adventure yeah that's yeah. cute it's a cute little it's, game so Celestia is like Deep Sea Adventures' next older brother. It's a little bit, a little bit, uh, yeah. a little bit meatier. Right. Yeah. Deep Sea Adventure is like you know, it's that would to me is filler. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and fake artist light. goes to New York is filler. It's it's peop, It's one of your typical games, like uh, you know, cool or any kind of secret identity game where you're trying to figure out who's who and who's got what. But instead of uh, being cards that are face down and people are trying to guess, people are making one line on a piece of paper. Everyone but the fake artist knows what we're trying to draw. You don't want to give away too much of the drawing, but at the same time, the fake artist is trying to figure out what they're drawing. And, and when it comes to their turn, they've got to make a mark that closely <laughs> resembles what everybody else is drawing, or else they're going to get called out as the fake artist. So it's that a, sounds it's like, a, yeah, that sounds neat. It's a great little filler game. All right, BJ from Board Game Gumbo, Gumbo Live here. We got our guest, Steve Finn. Steve, the last thing that we like to do is yeah. uh, for, for a first-time guest, is do something we call the Envy game. The Envy game is just, it's a little Cajun French word for something we really want, something we've got a hankering for. And in this yeah. context, it's a game that you want to, oh yeah, Steve says uh, that only game is Pictionary Spyfall. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way to call it. So in this particular instance, don't tell me what it is, but if there's a game that you'd like to play right now, doesn't matter if you own it in your collection, uh, you know, or you've never played it before, or maybe it's a favorite game. If there's a game, we're going to play 20 questions and try to figure it out and you, see if you can stump me and Alex and uh, Steve O'Rourke. Oh, uh, all right. Let me let me think of the game then first. Yeah, you think of the game and we'll... Right. Uh... So 
So it it could have it's already out. Uh, it's just something maybe that I want. Well, that will be one of our questions. So if you want to tell me right now, that's uh, one okay, free yeah, question yeah, for no, us. No, all right, yeah. Let me. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the game. I, you know, anytime I'm ever put on the spot to think it's of tough. something quickly, I'm terrible yep. at it. Uh, <laughs> well, don't worry. We're equally bad at this game. Uh, Steve has got a big lead on me, and I'm horrible at the game that I've designed. So it's 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 not very good. Uh, I actually do have something. All right. Let's start it yeah, out. I, I want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Here's a game, a game that you have an envy to play right now. If Steve was at your house, you'd look at him and say, we're going to play this game. So let's see if we can guess it. No, okay? but wait. It, that, that would assume that, I, that it, I, I own it. No, no, you don't have to own it. This is, oh. this is just, this is just right. if you could play a game. If I could play, play a right game now. and it can magically appear. It would magically appear. Unless I just pulled it off my shelf. Or you pulled it off your shelf. Yes. <laughs> All right, okay. so Alex's first question, which doesn't count for me, but he says, hey, has it been published in the past year? <clears throat> yes. All right, is it competitive or cooperative? Competitive. Okay. Is it uh, an American designer or a European designer? I'm guessing not Japanese because you haven't mentioned any Japanese designs. I think European. European, okay. Yeah, European. Is it board-based or card-based? Board. Got a board on it, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I would say board. It's not card-based. Okay. Board-based. <clears throat> um, came out in the last year. Um, I believe it came out in the last year. Alex wants to know, is it an abstract or a thematic game? Thematic. Thematic. Okay. That, no, you don't really, that wasn't one of your big things. So that, that surprises me. Let's see. Although you do, you're not. No, no, but you, wait, wait. When you're <clears throat> like abstract to me means there's no theme. Yep. It's just. Squares and circles, pushing, sure. you know, ball, you know. So theme to me is like it could be a pasted on theme. No, I agree with and you. An, yeah, an abstract like chess or O trio or checkers or something like that. Although some right. abstract games do have pasted on themes, or maybe it's the opposite. Right. Some games are yeah, really yeah, yeah, just yeah. abstracts dressed up. I mean, it's thematic for sure, but it's not like I, I'll feel immersed in this. So uh, Alex oh, actually, was I, I just played Azul. What what'd you think? I liked it. Yeah, yeah. See, that would I would consider that an abstract game. Okay. Yeah. It does I mean, have it a does theme, have of a, course. Right, I know, but it's so it, that one is so pasted on. Yeah. Steve wants to know if dice play a part in it. Oh, that's a good question. No. I hadn't thought of that. No. Oh, no dice in the game. Oh, interesting. I Steve. don't uh I I ha- I don't know if there's dice in it. I don't think there's dice. Okay. Yeah, I've got Azul coming in. I'm very int- uh, intrigued by that. I I, I love uh, that Iberian Peninsula, and it's it's got the whole Portuguese uh, artwork and the theme and everything. So I, I can't wait to try Azul. Although I, I'm 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 expecting that there's not much theme to it. It's just basically an abstract. So it is. Uh, I'm interested in that. Um. All right. So. What is the theme of that? Is it a space theme? No. Space theme. No, a space theme. Okay. Is it a fantasy theme? Nope. Alex wants to know if it came out before or after Essen. I wouldn't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay. That was a good question, but um, would you consider it a short game filler, 30 minutes or less, or a, a bigger game? Yes. Oh, it is a shorter game. Hmm. Shorter game. Oh, oh, I was thinking, um, how long is Majesty? That's not. Yeah, but you said, uh, let's see. You said not a fantasy theme, so it wouldn't be Majesty. Not a space theme. Hmm. 30 minutes or less. All right, so let's recap. It's a competitive game, <laughs> Alex and Steve, <laughs> while I stall. Uh, European designer, he thinks. It's a board-based. Do you want a hint? 
Oh, if you got you one, that'd hint? be great. Yeah, that'd be great if you got a little hint there for us. Uh, it's only published in German right now. Oh, that's going to be tough for me then. Uh, only published in German. Alex Fister has a new short game that's only in German, but it hasn't been released here yet. I don't even know the name of it. Um, and you're ready for another hint? Yeah, yeah, sure. It is related to a game that we have talked about. It's a game you've talked about. Wow, man, that's, <laughs> you know, that's a tricky one there. Um, so I'm thinking, how do you say ultimate Frisbee in German? I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, that's nothing to do. No, not <laughs> ultimate. Steve O'Rourke says, what about Tybor? Is it Tybor? No, it's not Tybor. Tybor. And, and I would also say... It's not like I am so looking forward to playing this game. Like, I really want this game. But it is a game I want to see because I'm very interested in finding out. And I'll tell you another hint. How they've made it more interesting for just two players. Okay. (laughs) That's it. It's Wasserveld. (laughs) Wasserveld Das Dice Game. Yes. No, it's not Wasserveld. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's not that. Uh, <clears throat> Ein Bierbete. Mm, let's see. Let's so it's see. Uh, a two-player uh-huh. version of a game that I have mentioned. A two-player game of version. Oh, man. Oh. But it's now only in German. So it's a game that you've mentioned and two-player only. The last ones that I know that have come out two-player, Caverna came out, but that was last Essen. That's yeah, Caverna. I didn't mention Caverna, though. Yeah, you never mentioned Caverna. Um, man, let's see. All right, you want one more hint? That's yeah. Exactly, well, but it's, I'll give it to you. Oh, yeah? It has to do with animals. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm drawing a blank. Steve, Alex, you got anything? It has to do with animals. Um, let's see. So, uh, let's see. I don't think you've played it. Yes. Although it's time for you to teach someone that you know how to play I think it. It was your niece. Did you say your niece? So, is there a Coloretta two player game coming out? Or Zuloretta? Yeah. Zuloretta two player? That's called Zuloretto Das Duel. Oh, you know, I did hear a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Z- Zuloretta Das Duel. Well, he, yeah. you stumped See, us. I, I like Zuloretto. I, I mean, but it's not like, oh, my God, I love Zuloretto. But I like it. I think it's a really fun little cute game. But I've always been somewhat displeased by the two-player rules. So I wanted to see how uh, how how well it works with two players. See if they've made – because I'm always interested as a designer – in t- making tweaks to games to make it two players. So, for example, Seven Wonders Duel, right? Yep. I, I really like that game for a, I, the way they like Seven Wonders into a, two, a two-player game. Although like it's very it. different. I like it better than the original. I really do. No, I like no, Duel. I, do too. I actually do. I do like it more. So I, I wanted I, to see, is Zularetto Duel going to be kind of like that? Is it going to be better or not? Yeah, it's tough because some games just don't, I don't like the two player because it's uh well you're gonna take this piece and you're gonna block the other guy or you're right. gonna sort of play a, a dummy piece and I'm not a big fan of that. That's what I thought Seven Wonders Duel was brilliant. I really did. Well, yeah. that's good. Zularetta two player. It's called Zularetta Das Duel and it's not out in America yet. Yeah. All but right, board gamers. Gonna, I think I know what's coming out. Yeah. All right, board gamers. That's it for another episode of Gumbo Live. I want to thank my guest, Steve Finn from Doctor Finn Games. Hey, Steve, how can people reach you if they want to get your games or talk to you about uh, games? Yeah, that's great. Uh, you can just do a Google search for Doctor Finn's games. Uh, the website is drfins dot com. You spell out doctor. Um, you can go to that site. I have links to my Facebook, my Twitter. I have an email list. I give away a free game every month to someone on my email list. Nice. So if you go to my site, you sign up, uh, you know, there's over a thousand people on that list, but so you'll you'll have a thousand and one odds uh, to win a free game. And I, you know, I use Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. So 
go check out my web web page, sign up for my email, like my Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, and you'll be apprised of everything that I'm doing. And you've got two, a double Kickstarter coming out in March, you said? Double Kickstarter coming out in f- probably February. Oh, February? Yeah, probably early February. I'm very close to finishing everything up right now. And tell us about the games again. It's Cosmic Run, Regenerated, so it's and... Cosmic Run, Regeneration, and The Waters of Nereus. Waters of Nereus. We're looking yeah, forward and I to have, seeing uh, I have a game called The Little Flower Shop, which is in production now, but that's going to be uh, made. It's being made now. It's going to be finished in like a week, and I'll have those. That's my newest game, and that's going to be for sale starting also in like February. Well, good luck with the Kickstarter and good luck with the uh, the sales of that game. Make sure to like our Facebook uh, page, facebook.com slash boardgamegumbo. It's the best way to get the word out on when we're going to do our next show. Upcoming uh, show Tuesday, we've got an uh, we've got an artist, uh, one of the guys that did uh, Fate of the Elder Gods and uh, one of my favorite games, uh, New Bedford. So check that out. He'll be coming in uh, next week. Uh, I'm BJ from Board Game Gumbo. This is Gumbo Live, episode number 24. And until next time, Steve, laissez-le, bon temps roulé. Take care. Thanks for coming in.